Hi, my name's Fred Zelt. I'm a geologist and cyclist living in Pittsburgh. And uh, I'd like to talk with you about uh, geology of Western Pennsylvania as it relates to uh, several of the bike trails that we have here. Um, and this episode, we're gonna focus on uh, the, the Southwest, Southwestern Pennsylvania and adjacent areas plateau. So let me share my screen and get this talk going. Here we go. So um, you can see the trails that are the focus of this talk. Um, uh, we're looking at the Pittsburgh Plateau and those uh, bike rides uh, are part of a series being sponsored this year by Venture Outdoors and Earth Science Excursions. It's actually a series of 25 trails where we'll be doing rides from end of April through mid-October. Um, and the ones that are covered in this talk are highlighted. There are five of those you can see highlighted in the darker colors, both on the map and in the list. And uh, the purpose in making and sharing this video is both to give background for anyone uh, who's going on those trips who would like to uh, watch a geology video, uh, but also for anyone else who might be interested. Um, we're really not trying to sell trips here. Um, they're pretty much all booked up as it is, so there's no point in that. Um, but one of our goals is to encourage people to get out and explore the many great trails that we have in our area. And so we're highlighting each one in, in this series of geology themed talks. There you can see the six themes um, and the plateau theme is uh, the one with the black outline. Um, the others, um, we've posted a, a video about the Allegheny and Upper Ohio River Valleys that focused on uh, glacial times the last two or three million years and how those river systems have been uh, shaped by uh, glaciers having come. Um, in the plateau edition here, we're going to focus on the bedrock, the rocks that are hundreds of millions of years old. So that bedrock geology uh, occurs through the rest of the plateau too, including uh, where the valley uh, bike rides are um, and some of the other rides too. Um, so a lot of the geology that we'll talk about here is relevant to a broader part of the plateau than just the black outline. But each of these colors has something special about it. Um, and you can, again can see the six themes here. The five trails uh, covered in this one are the West Penn Trail, the West Moreland Heritage Trail, the Panhandle, the Montour, and the Sheepskin and Mon River uh, Rail Trails. And the objective here is to help give a better understanding of the geologic underpinning of the landscapes in the plateau, and also uh, why the railroads that became trails are located where they are. Um, we'll have a big focus as you can see in the agenda on energy resources, but we'll start out with a, a bit of the general geologic setting of the plateau. Um, agriculture has been really important here uh, for a very long time and will be in the future. So we'll talk about soil rainfall and climate briefly. And then uh, we'll talk about each of the trails and, and introduce them, the, the rails that became the trails. So it's appropriate uh, to start off with this map of uh, big picture landscapes. I hope you can see the outline of Pennsylvania here. And this is an elevation map. Um, you'll see a couple of these. The red colors are higher elevations, the greens are lower elevations. And away from the coastal plain in New Jersey and Delaware here where the elevations are all low and flat and there are relatively young sediments at the surface. Away from there and the lake plain along Lake Erie, which also has relatively young sediments at the surface. In between those, the rocks at the surface are typically uh, hundreds of millions of years old, very old rocks at the surface. Uh, Pittsburgh's located right here. And the rocks at the surface here in Pittsburgh uh, were once buried something like 8,000 feet deep, uh, give or take 1,000 feet, uh, were buried much more deeply than today. The sediment and rock that used to be on top has all been eroded away, it's gone off to ocean basins. But that's why it's hard rock at the surface, because once these were buried deeply and they were buried deeply for hundreds of millions of years, so the rocks had 
uh, temperature and pressure and time to grow cements between the grains and become hard rock. Um, in southeastern Pennsylvania and uh, this part of Virginia in the Piedmont, uh, the rocks there uh, were once buried typically uh, 30,000 feet or more and have been thrust up from great depth and then also um, had the sediment on top, the rocks on top eroded away um, because of a, a big continent scale collision between part of Africa and part of North America. And that collision was around 300 million years ago. It made a big mountain belt here that's worn down to its roots now. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that in one of the other theme talks. Um, but the point to see here is how different the landscapes are here in the plateau versus these other landscapes. And that that's a, that's a theme that's a continent margin theme. It's a very broad area uh, that that theme covers. So there actually were folds created um, in this part of the mountain belt that's now worn down to its roots. In fact, you can see these broad folds in front of the mountain belt. See how this is an upward fold. That's uh, Chestnut Ridge, there's Laurel Hill, there's the Ligonier Syncline in between. Here's where the Yakagani River cuts through. Um, the Kanama River cuts through also uh, farther north. But those are broad folds of sedimentary rocks that originally were laid down in horizontal layers, uh, but, but that were buckled and folded by that continental scale collision 300 or so million years ago. But he, And we'll talk again uh, more about that in another theme. The theme we have here is in the plateau where the rocks are fairly flat lying. So there's no real preferred orientation to the river drainages. The rivers go every which direction. If you're driving along a stream valley, you know that you're winding around and going every point in the compass almost. Um, there's no preferred orientation to drainage because of these flat lying layers. Compared with here in central Pennsylvania, where there are long ridges and long valleys, each of those are rock layers, sedimentary rock layers that are tipped up on their sides or on their ends by that uh, collision. So a very different series of landscapes here um, that relate uh, a lot to the geology. And I'm gonna show you um, just an example of the layering uh, in a picture. Um, the location is uh, from Wellsburg, West Virginia and the West Virginia Panhandle. We'll be looking across the Ohio River there at what the rock layers look like typically in the plateau. So here we are looking across the Ohio. Uh, brilliant Ohio is just uh, on that side of the outcrop. So I call it the brilliant outcrop. It's a great outcrop. Um, here's a thick uh, sandstone layer. Um, the whole outcrop here is maybe 300 feet high. Um, I'll talk about the Pittsburgh coal later on. The Pittsburgh coal is actually um, uh, up here. And this, it's, it's actually this. Uh, it's up in that part of the outcrop. Um, there's a bench and it's sort of behind the bench, so it's hard to see. These uh, light colored layers are non-marine limestones. The gray layers up here are shales, um, non-marine shales, so coastal plain shales. This is a sandstone that was deposited by rivers. Uh, some of the sandstones down here might have been at the mouth of a delta. There are some thin marine limestones. This is the Ames limestone. It's the most marine limestone in this part of the section, it has lots of marine fossils in it. Um, but the limestones that are light colored up here are all non-marine limestones. And we'll talk about those uh, a bit when we talk about the geology and we talk about soil quality. But the point, the main point of this was to show you so clearly how flat lying the rock layers here are versus in central Pennsylvania where they're tipped up on their side. These are the physiographic official provinces of Pennsylvania. Um, they're pretty finely split. Um, and you can see here's the Pittsburgh Low Plateau and that's subdivided into a Waynesburg Hill section that still has flat lying rocks, but is very hilly. Um, this was that raised up area with the ridges and valleys that I talked about uh, in the Laurel Highlands. Um, and then this is the fold belt proper uh, with those long ridges and long valleys. This is where we saw the broad folds of Chestnut Ridge and, and Laurel Hill. Um, there are glaciated parts of Pennsylvania too, and there's gonna be a whole glacial theme uh, to talk about those. So this is a geologic map of Pennsylvania. It's a bit generalized. And the colors on this map relate to the ages of the rock layers that are at the surface today. Permian in age, hundreds of millions of years old, 
but younger than Pennsylvanian, Mississippian. So Pennsylvanian rocks, 300-ish million years old. Uh, getting even older than that, uh, maybe uh, older than 350 million years uh, for Devonian. So hundreds of millions of years old rock layers, and they generally are younger in this part of the plateau, and then they generally get older in that direction. And you can see these broad folds on this map because the broad upward folds there, um, there's been erosion that's exposed older rock layers in the cores of those broad folds. And there are some broad folds in the plateau also, but they're lower relief. The relief on these is one to 2,000 feet of amplitude on those folds, and it's hundreds of feet of relief on the broad folds in the plateau, so much flatter. There are older rock layers exposed in central Pennsylvania, and those are underground for us. Uh, they're older and they're underneath us in the plateau. So we're going to focus uh, then on the, this part of the plateau. In the next uh, slide, we'll see a more detailed geologic map for the greater Pittsburgh area. You can see uh, Allegheny County and the counties that surround it. Uh, Washington, Westmoreland, Armstrong, Butler, and Beaver counties. So this is a more detailed geologic map. It's a finer subdivision of layers, but again, those Permian age layers here, and then older sedimentary rock layers. And you can see that where the rivers and streams cut down into these more or less flat lying rock layers, uh, there are older parts of the section, older rock layers exposed down in the bottoms of the stream valleys than are up high on the tops. So that's why it has such an intricate pattern here. But also you can see the folds I mentioned. Here are some older rock layers exposed in the cores of upward folds where they're exposed by erosion. There's some younger rock layers exposed in the downward parts of the folds here. And that theme continues. And this is um, an upward fold uh, with those have a special name called an anticline. And this is named for Murraysville where it's a, there's a prominent gas field there uh, from the past. Um, in, gas that was trapped in, in part by this upward fold in the rock layer. Uh, gas is lighter than water that saturates uh, these rocks in the subsurface. So the gas tends to, uh, if it's trapped, it, it's sort of a bubble of gas uh, trapped, uh, in this case, on part of an upward fold. So we'll talk about the Murraysville anticline later. But remember this map when you see a soils map, that these are those younger uh, rocks, including Permian and uppermost Pennsylvanian rocks, uh, which were in the upper part of the outcrop I showed you um, that had lots of non-marine limestones and shales and fewer sandstones uh, and, and more limestone, I guess, than the, the deeper part of the section in that outcrop. So that relates to the soils there too. Okay, this is another uh, way to look at the rocks across Pennsylvania. Uh, it's like a cross section uh, going from east to west, from uh, right to left, and it's vertically arranged by age. So older rock ages at the bottom, younger at the top, although Pennsylvania, as I mentioned, around 300 million years or so, so it's still pretty old. Uh, Cambrian is 500 some million years old. Oops. And the, this time the colors, instead of relating to the age of rocks, the color is the type of rock. So the yellows are sandstones made up of sand-sized grains, primarily. Um, the blues are uh, carbonate rocks. Limestone is calcium carbonate. Dolostone has some magnesium in it. Um, and so those are the blue colors here. Um, and the, uh, uh, the uh, red colors and the uh, white colors here are uh, clay-rich rocks, shales. Uh, the white ones are offshore. They're marine shales deposited in a seaway that was up here on the continent at times. Um, and these red layers are shale-rich uh, coastal plain deposits behind shorelines. So here's a series of shoreline sandstones and fluvial sandstones that were building out into a seaway in uh, Upper Devonian time. Uh, they had coastal plain sediments behind them, so some rivers, but lots of coastal plain shales. And in front of them were and offshore shales. And where those shales are especially uh, rich in algal organic matter, they're colored in dark gray here. And this one is the Marcellus shale. It's the major shale gas target. 
This one is the Utica shale uh, with some other offshore shales above it, but the basal part of it here is especially organic rich. And that's another shale gas target along with the carbonate just at the bottom of it. Um, these these uh, sandstone layers interleaved with marine shales um, are important shallow reservoirs for conventional accumulations of oil and gas. And we'll, we'll have a series of slides that highlight those because that's been such an important resource in the past. The upper part of the chart here, the rocks that are exposed in the surface in southwestern Pennsylvania and adjacent areas in the plateau, those uh, Mississippian, Permian, Pennsylvanian rocks. Um, there are some thin marine limestones, like I mentioned. The black bands here are coals. There's more than two of those, um, although there aren't that many that are especially thick. There are lots of thin ones. Lots of sandstones in the lower part. The upper part has non-marine limestones and lots of coastal plain shales. Um, so those are things, rock layers that are at the surface. And uh, that's the um, rough age of uh, rocks typically at the surface here in the plateau. I mentioned 300 million years, give or take. The divisions here are each 10 million years. There's the age of the Marcellus, the age of the Utica shale gas targets. And um, that's, a, that's a long time ago. But in terms of Earth history, um, Earth history goes back over four and a half billion years. So it's a, a small part of Earth history overall. And the kinds of depositional environments of those 300 million year old or so rocks, um, you can see an outline of Pennsylvania. There's that mountain belt that was growing off to the east and shedding uh, sands into rivers, uh, uh, being shed off into a coastal plain here. Um, this is an inland sea to the west. Um, and so there were the kinds of deposits that we would have in the plateau here are sands and river channels, sands that would splay into um, coastal plain in between, some clays and silts in the coastal plain, maybe uh, contributed by floods uh, overtopping the banks of rivers at times, sands at the mouths of rivers and deltas. Um, there could be uh, lakes that deposit freshwater carbonates, like the ones I mentioned in the upper part of the, that outcrop. Um, at times and in places. This is a, a peat swamp that's growing in a quiet area in between deltas. Sometimes uh, the whole system of rivers seems to have shut off and you'll see for the Pittsburgh coal it was deposited over a huge area all at the same time. So there was a huge peat swamp that lasted a pretty long time over a really big area that made a very special uh, deposit and an important one for us. This was, as I'll show uh, when I talk about climate, like the last two or three million years, this was a time when glaciers, continental scale glaciers came and went. And associated with that were large uh, rises and falls in sea level, worldwide sea level. So at times here, this inland sea flooded and there were marine limestones deposited across our area, like that Ames limestone that I showed you in the outcrop. At other times, uh, the sea retreated and deltas and rivers built out so that uh, in a vertical, uh, in one given spot, you can have a whole vertical series of different uh, ones of those depositional environments. And that's what this is meant to represent. This is kind of an idealized cycle. You could think of this as a sea level cycle where uh, the sea floods in, you got a marine limestone, some marine shales, then a river and delta, they, they build back out. Um, and you have river sandstones and deltaic sandstones on top of that. You might have coastal plain here with shales uh, from in between rivers and on, on top of river deposits. You might have some lacustrine limestones deposited. And then if it's a quiet area or a quiet time, uh, a lot of peat deposited that when it's buried turns into coal. And then the whole thing repeats again with another marine flooding. And this whole series of uh, sandstones, shales, limestones, coals, um, is typically tens of feet thick in our area. It's not always an ideal sequence like this. Sometimes a uh, river channel might cut down all through the previous part of the sequence. So none of that's uh, preserved in a given spot. So it's a bit of an idealized sequence, but I think you can see the different rock types that occur in the plateau in the rocks that are at the surface. So here's a, a vertical section, uh, again, colored by rock type. It's from two different publications. So the, the color schemes they've used are a little bit different, but they both used 
yellow stippled pattern for sandstones. So those could be river sandstones or deltaic sandstones. That's the sandstone that was in the middle of the brilliant outcrop I showed you. It's called the Morgantown sandstone. This is the range of uh, rock layers that was in that outcrop. There's the Pittsburgh coal. I mentioned the Ames limestone uh, was below the Morgantown sandstone, which had cut way down in that outcrop. Uh, the other colors here, the browns and the reds in the lower part here are uh, clay rich rocks, shales, um, red beds, uh, very clay rich. Um, some uh, marine shales or non-marine coastal plain shales. Underneath some of the coals, uh, you can see in the lower part of the section here are these gray colored uh, special, very special clays underneath coals. They were soils that were formed underneath the peat swamps. Uh, the, the peat swamp water was acidic. It uh, took away a lot of the content of the minerals that had been there and often left a very special deposit uh, that in places uh, was really good for making high temperature brick, fire brick. So uh, lots of uh, ingredients for making bricks. And on these rides, we will go past some uh, former brick plants, um, clays for those, and lots of energy deposits uh, for baking them too, including these coals. The upper part of the section, you can see we're getting these limestones. The lighter color here is non-marine limestones, like the ones we saw. These are the ones we saw in the upper part of that outcrop. And then when we get above here, there aren't nearly as many sandstones. There are a lot of more shales uh, than sandstones. And there still are these non-marine limestones, which really help with uh, making uh, good quality soils for agriculture. OK, I promised to talk about climate a little bit. And this is going to be very brief. I'll talk about, about climate uh, in some detail uh, in the glacial talk. It'll be really appropriate to talk about it there. But this, this is a chart, uh, it's just from Wikipedia. The horizontal axis is uh, years before present. So present day is over here on the right. And the axis changes in scale. It's 5,000 years apart. These divisions are 200,000 years, a million years apart, 10 million years apart, 100 million years apart. So the axis uh, really changes a lot. The vertical axis is a proxy of uh, temperature. What uh, global temperature is thought to have been. You can think of it as global average temperature. And obviously, uh, you know, this is way back in time. These aren't direct measurements. It's a proxy. And uh, the proxy that's used for this is stable oxygen isotopes. Stable oxygen isotopes are a very good indicator of temperature. And where the data are blue here, uh, the data come from ice cores. They're oxygen isotopes in H2O from cores of ice in Antarctica and Greenland that you can see here go back 800,000 years. Uh, and before that, these other colors, the uh, oxygen comes from calcium, car calcium carbonate, <laughs> sorry, uh, from marine fossils, uh, from the shells of marine organisms. And those go back 500 million years. So uh, these are glacial interglacial cycles. And this is a, a time of continental scale glaciations. We're in an interglacial cycle now. They're, our continental scale glaciers in Greenland and, uh, and Antarctica, but they don't come all the way down through Canada into Pennsylvania like they did 18 or 20,000 years ago in the last glacial maximum. And they don't cover Northern Europe and much of Russia like they did then too. Uh, these are also sea level changes. So when these glaciers melted since the last uh, glacial maximum, sea level rose something like 120 meters. So these are both uh, climate cycles uh, cold part of the cycle down at the bottom, the warmer interglacial cycles above, but these are also sea level cycles. Another time in Earth history when uh, climate is thought to have generally been about as cold as it is in the last few million years is the age of the rocks that are at the surface in the plateau about 300 million years ago. This was another glacial interglacial period. Now where we are in southwestern Pennsylvania was actually very close to the equator, so we don't have glaciations right here at that time. But there were continents assembled at the South Pole, and there were continental scale glaciers and deposits that they left behind uh, leave a record there. But surely uh, 300 million years ago, there were sea level fluctuations because of glaciers coming and going in cycles, just like we've had in the last two or three million years. So it's easy to imagine 
global sea level having gone up and down, as I described in the vertical sections of those rocks. Okay, now let's start talking about resources in the plateau because they're abundant and, and high quality. Um, so we'll start off with the ones that are really important for agriculture. And with soil, here you can see a soil map and the green indicates soils that are especially good for agriculture. And you can see that in the, this part of the plateau in southwestern Pennsylvania, Panhandle um, and northern West Virginia, north, uh, northwestern West Virginia, you have this soil that's especially good for agriculture. And I think I, I tried to indicate why that there are thin limestones and shales there. Um, and uh, that's, that's been really good. There's some really good soils in central Pennsylvania as well uh, that are lime ba limestone based soils, a much older limestone unit than the uh, soils here. And there's some other uh, soils that have lots of calcium carbonate in them to the west as well. So that's a pretty special thing about that part of the plateau is that it has some pretty great soils that need less fertilizer to make things grow really well. So that means it's less costly to, to farm crops there. We know that uh, we have temperate climate here and a, a really nice long growing season. Um, and, uh, but I wanted to show you a rainfall chart. So we typically have 40 or 50 inches of rain here in our part of the plateau. Um, in the higher plateau to the east where uh, uh, lake effect rain uh, happens even more because as, as the moist air goes there, it, it cools off as it gets higher. Uh, going over the lower highlands, they get 10 inches or so more rain than in the low plateau. So plenty of abundant rain, good soils uh, in much of the plateau and uh, good climate. So good for agriculture. Now let's move to other resources and we'll focus on energy resources, coal, oil, natural gas, nuclear and wind. And to kick this off, I wanted to uh, highlight the uh, present day importance of this <laughs> and how much things have changed in the last 10 or 15 years, huge change. Um, this is uh, use of fuel to make, to generate electricity by state. And uh, the most recent one of these I was able to find, it goes up to 2019. So the trends that have been changing here, there's a couple of years since this was made and, and these have continued. Uh, they haven't reversed, they've continued. Um, so look at this, here's West Virginia, um, a lot of, West Virginia coal, uh, electricity comes from coal. It was 98% uh, in 2001, 11 years ago. And it's still very high, 91%. But there's been more natural gas. West Virginia has a part of the shale gas revolution. So there's been some uh, more um, electricity generation from natural gas and a little bit less from coal there, even in West Virginia. Look at Ohio, 87% coal. Uh, fired power plants uh, in 2001, and that's gone down to 39%. These are huge changes in a relatively short time. And uh, Ohio has a share of the shale gas revolution. The Utica play works really well in Southeastern Ohio. So now natural gas accounts for 43% of power generation uh, to power Ohio. And nuclear uh, has gone from 11 to 14%. So it's been a pretty st steady contributor. Other renewables you can see, uh, unfortunately, are a very small part of all of these. And that's, that's one of the things that's tough is it's hard to, uh, um, e even if you double uh, renewables in a relatively short period, you're doubling from a pretty small base. So it's hard to, for them to take a huge chunk out of the fossil fuel energy uh, picture. Here in Pennsylvania, uh, it was 57% coal in the past. That's down to 17% in 2019. Uh, natural gas uh, has been huge here. The shale gas revolution has been a really big thing in Pennsylvania. So over 40% of electricity generation from that. And then nuclear has been in the, about a third of the mix uh, and a pretty steady uh, contributed through that time. So just huge changes through time. And again, you can see wind, hydro, uh, down in the renewables mix. I wanted you to see that in terms of where the power plants are too. This is from 2014, so this has changed a little bit since then. There aren't quite as many 
coal-fired power plants active as there were um, eight years ago. Uh, the the uh, gray, dark gray here are coal-fired power plants. Um, the uh, orangish, yellowish color are uh, uh, natural gas ones. Um, and uh, you can see that there's some hydro here on the Mon. Um, there's Kinzu Dam has uh, hydro too. Um, and this is wind, it's a renewable. Um, you can see that nuclear are in this uh, reddish brown color. Um, and it must be hidden by the coal because there's a coal fire plant, power plant that used to be right next to uh, the Beaver Valley generating station. That's an active nuclear plant. And by the way, nuclear has been a big thing in the plateau here for a long time. The first successful commercial uh, nuclear generating station was at Shippensport using a relatively small reactor that was meant for a, a aircraft carrier. Uh, but that's, it's still here and it's been there here for a long time in our energy mix. There's another hydro uh, along the Kanama here, but it, it must be underneath one of these big uh, coal bubbles. So here you get to see uh, not just a, a chart for the whole state, but um, you can see it regionally too. Okay, so coal is an important part of the energy mix. It, it uh, was a, an even bigger part in the past. And I'll just mention that uh, the significant fraction of coal that's mined in the US today is exported. Um, this map shows in gray, the extent of coals in the Appalachian Basin, and the darker shades of gray are specifically the Pittsburgh coal, that one uh, unit that I talked about and, and pointed to in the upper part of that outcrop. So it's over a really large area that there's this single coal unit that was deposited. The part where it's especially dark here is where it has um, uh, a good uh, content in terms of uh, being a pure coal, a more pure coal, uh, a good ash content, a, a favorable uh, sulfur content. Um, it's just not as high quality outside of that darker area. Um, so we're, we're going to kind of focus on that darker part of this. And here's a, one of the coal-fired power plants that we'll see on our 25 cycling trips, uh, and many, many of those in the plateau area. This one's along the Sheepskin Mon Valley Rail Trail. Uh, just south of the Pennsylvania-West Virginia border. It's a pretty impressive facility to see from the trail uh, from across the river. These are uh, the rock layers again, and I wanted to highlight the main coals that are, have been mined in the plateau. I mentioned the Pittsburgh coal, but there are others too. I'll mention the upper Freeport and Catanning. Um, they're not as consistently thick uh, as the Pittsburgh coal. None of them are. It's really a been a tremendous resource. And as you can see with the black bands on this chart, there are a lot of other coals that are locally mined and important, but none is like the Pittsburgh. You saw the huge area that it covered. So it's estimated that there have been 18 billion short tons mined so far. Um, and if you use today's value of coal, uh, that's about $2 trillion worth of coal that was mined in the Pittsburgh scene. Mm -hmm. If you use an average value of coal for the last several years, it might be half that, just $1 trillion at recent prices. So just a tremendous resource. Um, so here's uh, one of the thinner coals. This is up in the Freeport part of the section. This is along the but Butler Freeport Community Trail. A uh, couple of coal outcrops here. Um, here's this uh, really soft weathering shale. This is the least resistant. Uh, unit to erosion that we have are these really clay rich layers underneath coals that used to be a soil underneath a peat swamp. And as I mentioned, some of those have a very special composition um, and are uh, were used to make uh, uh, fire brick, uh, refractory brick that could withstand temperatures over 3000 degrees Fahrenheit and, and wood line furnaces um, that are very high temperature. So there are lots of thin coals like this. Freeport coal was mined in this area, but not super extensively. Um, and we'll talk about that uh, when we cycle the Butler Freeport Community Trail. And if you're not cycling with me then, um, just search my name on YouTube and you'll find a, a whole talk about the Eastern half of the Butler Freeport Community Trail with a whole bunch of geology in it. 
Here's an outcrop in Southern Allegheny County of the Pittsburgh coal. It's all of six feet thick here. You can see the arrows indicating that. There's the base of the coal. This is the coal. They are naturally fractured with this blocky fracture. Here's another one of these ancient soil units below it that uh, um, uh, is very soft and, and weathers very easily and has a very special composition because of the uh, where it was deposited and that it was exposed to the peat swamp waters. So here's uh, a map again of the Pittsburgh coal, but now we're only looking at the area where it had a, a, a really good composition uh, to be used um, as a, a fuel. Uh, this is a thickness map now, and the light blue here indicates where it's about six or seven feet thick. So it's six or seven feet thick over a really big area the reddish colors, it's even thicker. So it's even thicker off to the um, east. And uh, <laughs> the Connellsville uh, area where it it's, uh, has a great composition for making coke uh, to use in steel making, it's also especially thick. So that was just a, an amazing thing. Um, so very thick over a big area. This is the same type of map. Uh, but this time the red indicates where it's uh, basically been mined. Uh, uh, if not completely, then, then pretty completely. And um, it, uh, it crops out uh, up here in Allegheny County, about 50 feet below the top of Mount Washington, which used to be called Coal Hill. And that was the start of mining this coal in the mid 1700s. Um, they would just uh, dig it out of the face of the hill and use a trough and gravity to get it down to the river and transport it on the river. And now of course, transport along the rivers on, uh, in, in the rivers on barges and along the rivers by rail too. But that was the start of mining back away from the rivers, away back away from the Monongahela, back away from the Ohio rivers. You can see that the mines have gone back uh, as far as 10 miles. Once all the infrastructure there is there, then it's worth uh, digging down from the surface, even if the, Coal is hundreds of feet deep, it's still worth it because all the other infrastructure's there um, to uh, support continued mining. So very extensive mining in these areas where the coal is, was either at the surface or was relatively shallow. The stars here in this inset uh, blown up view of part of the map, and again, you can see these mined out areas in the subsurface mines as well as surface mines. The stars are, uh, uh, the starting points for uh, the, the bike rides we're going to do, uh, the trails that we're going to ride. And the ones with heavy outlines are the five that are specifically in this, uh, in this talk. Um, uh, these two were in the talk about the river valleys. Um, so the reason that the railroads are here or were here and, and are now abandoned, uh, to a great degree, the reason to be there was to serve coal mines um, in areas that are now mined out. So those rails uh, were available to turn into trails uh, because of that. And I'll mention again that there are also thinner coals and there still is coal mining in progress. Um, and, and there are thinner coals than the Pittsburgh uh, that, that occur beyond the colored part of this map. So I don't want you to think that this is the only place where there's any coal that's worth mining. There are uh, more patchy, uh, uh, areas of uh, uh, coals of other age uh, that have been mined and, and continue uh, to be mined. Okay, this is the same map, but it combines uh, in green here, the thickness of overburden, how much rock is on top of the Pittsburgh coal. So where it's mined underground, of course, where it's uh, mined or where, where there's a thousand feet, 1500 feet or even more of uh, rock on top, it's gonna to be harder to dig ventilation shafts. It's gonna be more expensive to mine. Um, if you're coming from the side, it's gonna take time to get in there, get in and out. It's just more costly to mine. So you can see that where there's a lot of overburden, even though the coal quality and thickness are quite good, um, there's still quite a lot of coal left in place even today. Okay, now let's turn to oil and natural gas. Um, the oil industry in the United States really was invented in Pennsylvania 
up here in Venango County. And this is a, a map of conventional oil and gas fields, the kinds of fields that would have been produced from the 1800s up until today, not the fields that are in the shale gas revolution. We'll talk about that separately. The colors here indicate uh, gas fields in pink or red, and then uh, in green are oil fields, and the shallow uh, gas fields and oil fields are in the pink and this uh, light green. And those are uh, younger than Marcellus uh, in age. Um, remember I pointed out those upper Devonian and Mississippian shoreline and, and uh, fluvial sandstones with uh, marine shales on top of them that made nice reservoir sealed pairs for uh, conventional fields. Those are really widespread over this area. Um, and so is, the, so is the source rock. The Marcellus source rock is very widespread. And where the Marcellus source rock becomes too shallow, uh, it's more shallow in this area than it is down here, where it's too shallow for it to have cooked enough uh, to uh, have expelled oil and gas, um, the Utica is, is uh, mature enough to be a source rock for oil and gas. So you have a couple of source rocks for oil and gas active here. And here there are fields that are in reservoir rocks that are older than the Marcellus, which are sourced by a source rock older than the Marcellus. So really extensive area of oil and gas production since the 1800s. And it's estimated that there have been something like 250,000 wells drilled for conventional oil and gas. Um, these shallow fields, uh, the typical depths there might be two or 3,000 feet, maybe as little as 1,000 feet or as much as 4,000 feet deep or so. So that's what I mean by relatively shallow fields and very extensive. And we'll look at a, a, a few of those uh, examples that are near our trails. Here's one from the uh, near the cradle of the industry. Um, this is the Allegheny River. This is the Samuel Justice Trail. And along the Samuel Justice Trail, you can see some pump jacks from old oil fields there from uh, shallow production. And here's a sign uh, for the Eclipse refinery that used to be across the river here from the trail. Um, there were a whole lot of little refineries all through this region of oil fields uh, serving the oil production. Um, this is uh, from uh, the Murraysville gas field. The Haymaker gas well was a big deal. And we'll talk about that in some detail in, in a few minutes. But this is a monument that's set up uh, right next to uh, the Westmoreland Heritage Trail. It goes right by that. And we will have a chance to see that. Um, the inset box here indicates a map that I'm going to show uh, on the next slide. And that map, instead of um, all the fields that have been found uh, uh, up until this map was made, I think in the 1980s or so, um, th that map is an older map. It's from 1921. So here's a look at oil and natural gas fields from 1921. And uh, again, the red or oil or gas fields, the green or oil fields. And uh, there's Pittsburgh. Um, the yellow bands are the parts of the trails that we're going to cycle, the Westmoreland, Montour, Panhandle, and Three River Trails. We won't cycle all of the trails, but those are the parts we're going to cycle. And um, this is the McDonald oil field. It's a huge area that it covered, a uh, pretty extensive oil field. Um, uh, Oakdale is at, at the end of our ride here, and McDonald was right here. So it's in the heart. These are in the heart of... Uh, that oil field, and we're going to go right through it. That ancient, that old oil field uh, that started in the 1800s. I'll also talk about the Murraysville gas field. Uh, Murraysville is is right here. This is the boundary of uh, Westmoreland County, um, and here's that uh, uh, Westmoreland Heritage Trail. We're going to go from uh, Trafford to Export on that that segment of the trail. So we're going to go right across. Murraysville Field, and that Haymaker well was, was right about here. <laughs> and we'll talk about both the McDonald Field and the Murraysville Field. First McDonald, uh, discovered in 1890 with some wells that were drilled on two McDonald farms, thus the name, 
it was big, 10 miles long, one to four miles across, 13,000 acres, and pretty continuous. Uh, people were able to find oil uh, pretty much wherever they drilled within that area, uh, from what I have read. Um, it's not known exactly how many wells were drilled for it, but it's well over 2,000 wells. And during the frenzy of drilling, uh, there were 100 wells drilled in uh, at McDonald Borough. Uh, there was drilling in parks, empty lots, yards, church property. The main zones were ab about 2,300 feet deep, so moderate depth uh, as these shallow fields went. Um, but by 1890, uh, oil production had been going on for some time, so technology had advanced some here, and there was infrastructure, and people knew what to do with it, how to refine it. There had been a market built for oil. So this huge oil field uh, you know, for its day, huge, uh, came about at a pretty opportune time. It produced as much as 83,000 barrels of oil per day. Uh, the total in the um, early 1900s was said to be 42 million barrels. So it's somewhere north of that that it produced. And some of these wells were just spectacular, even by today's standards for a conventional well, especially wells that were that shallow and relatively low pressure. Um, there were a few wells that produced more than 10,000 barrels a day. So to put that in perspective, today, right now, a barrel of oil is worth about $100. So if it were worth something like that, <laughs> that's uh, $100 per barrel. So uh, 10,000 barrels. So that's a uh, million dollars a day. Did I get that right? I think the math is right on that. A million dollars a day. And it would, they wouldn't have produced that long for years, but they would have produced that long for weeks, <laughs> maybe months. Um, one well uh, produced in its lifetime, two million barrels. One well. I mean, look at these wells. <laughs> one well. Uh, so a million barrels times $200 a barrel today's value. Uh, in today's value, that would be $200 million worth of oil from one well. So no wonder there are such nice houses <laughs> in McDonald and uh, a lot of these other towns and beautiful Victorian farmhouses uh, in southwestern Pennsylvania and up into the oil country. This, this really uh, created a lot of value uh, for people. Uh, along with all the industries and jobs that it, it supported. Well, let's look at another example. This is from Murraysville Field, the Haymaker Gas Well. So in 1878, some guys were drilling there. The reason they drilled there was um, they got wind that uh, there was a farmer who had a natural gas seep on his property. So there wasn't any drilling. Seeps happen, natural gas seeps happen, oil seeps happen, uh, those are natural. And this fellow was using the natural gas uh, to boil maple sap into syrup. So these guys heard about this. They thought uh, natural gas is uh, sometimes associated with oil. So they thought they would drill for oil there in that area. And they found a whole lot of gas at 1400 feet. So pretty shallow, the well blew out and it flowed uncontrolled for years at something like 34 million cubic feet per day. Uh, so 34 million cubic feet per day in terms of dollars, just to give a reference, gas, if natural gas is about $3 per thousand cubic feet, then I think that's uh, $100,000 a day uh, in terms of today's value of gas. Um, it flowed uncontrolled, it had a tremendous roar. People came from all over to look at this thing. The president came to look at it. The president of the United States came to look at it. It, it flowed like that for years. Uh, somebody with a lantern got too close to it and it caught fire in 1881. Then it burned for 18 months. It was said that the flame was visible from Pittsburgh. Um, there was no, no more nighttime in Murraysville uh, while that happened. Eventually they, they figured out a way to, to put it out. Um, it kept flowing though. Uh, finally, they got it controlled and there was no market for this. I mean, it, they were looking for oil and there's nothing to do with the gas, even if you could 
get it someplace. There weren't any pipelines to get it anywhere and, and there was no market for it. But when people saw what was happening, they started uh, thinking about how to use this. Um, George Westinghouse came to see this. He drilled a well in his backyard, which was in, uh, um, <laughs> in the city in Pittsburgh, uh, really upset the neighbors. He drilled some gas wells in his backyard. I think one of those blew out too. But after that, he thought about things and came up with about 30 patents on uh, finding ways to use this natural gas. And by 1884, they had this thing under control and, and had a pipeline uh, to deliver it to Pittsburgh to start using it for illumination and using it as an energy source in industry. So there's the amazing story of the Haymaker gas well. And uh, there, there are some uh, monuments to this right by the, the uh, trail that, that we'll see. Now I'm gonna take you on a, a bit of a dive into a little geology that uh, most people will never have a chance to see. So the curiosity to me is how, that, how did that well produce at such huge volume for so long? The rocks around here are typically pretty hard and tight. They just don't flow uh, gas or oil or water out of them or through them as readily as that indicated. So how did that happen? Here's uh, some work from a master's thesis that was done at WVU uh, several years ago now. And uh, this is from a well that was drilled near Delmont. So it's not from the Murraysville field, but it's not very far away. And uh, this is the uh, Murraysville sandstone, the main reservoir there in Murraysville field, the one that blew out, uh, was full of gas. And um, you can see a millimeter for scale in the slide on the left. A uh, quarter millimeter for scale, the one on the right. This is sandstone. This is what it looks like under a microscope. And the way to do this, um, it's hard rock. So um, it's cut and polished into a very thin slice. It's mounted on glass. And then you put a light on one side and you look at it from the other side. So this is light coming through a very thin slice of sandstone. And the white are quartz sand grains just like beach sand or river sand. This would have been river sand or, or uh, shoreline sand in the upper part of the sandstone. The darker grains are other fragments of rock that uh, were carried by the river down from the mountain belt that weren't just pure quartz. And here's one that's uh, gotten corroded by the fluids that used to be in the rock when it was in the subsurface. The blue here is epoxy that fills in voids in the rock. So you can picture if you had beach sand, it's full of voids, um, gas, water, anything can flow through those very readily. Well, this, this rock has lots of voids too. If anyone who's watching this is a geologist, uh, the permeability in the upper part of the Murraysville sandstone can be hundreds of millidarcies, even up to a darcy permeability. So it's, it, uh, fluids move very readily through some of this sandstone. It's really remarkable that this porosity is preserved and it's unusual um, in the region. It's not typical. This is a, like a cross section of the earth. Um, it's from another master's thesis at WVU. Uh, the vertical scale here, there's 50 feet. Each of these is a well log. So each of those is from a well in a line of section uh, like this. Murraysville is marked with the M on this map. You can see the outline of Westmoreland County here. Um, and so here's where Murraysville is. And uh, the yellow indicates sand. So in the well logs, we know from the nature of the measurements in the well log that this is sand. Uh, we know because of uh, cuttings that have come to the surface too, that this is sand. And the, the greenish color is clay rich shale. And you can tell how different those are in these uh, measurements on the well logs. So this uh, geologist uh, flattened this cross section on a level that's the same age everywhere in this interpretation in the shale. And so here's a sandstone body, like the one we saw in the outcrop. This is a highly squeezed section. This is five miles for scale. So this is a really laterally extensive sandstone, like, like the one we saw in the middle of the outcrop, except this is thinner. And it's a very, uh, uh, you know, there's not much shale within that and the heart of it too. Well, this is where the Murraysville gas field is. And actually, in, instead of being flat lying like this, the rocks are slightly tilted up to the right. And as I mentioned, gas is lighter than water. So 
where there's both water and gas in pores in the sandstone here, the gas floats to the top. So uh, because this was slightly tilted up, the gas accumulated um, in this part of the sandstone. And this is the part of the sandstone, the upper part uh, is, has those grains that I showed or in the other slides. It's uh, so uh, high in, in uh, pore space with, between the grains and fluids can, and gas can flow through it really well. But then they get stuck because here's all shale and no sand for it to go uh, continue to, for the gas to migrate up dip, up, uh, up structure. Again, you know, if this were not datumed on a level, this would be up in elevation in this direction. To help you picture that, um, here's a structure map. This is uh, like, uh, just like a topo map, except the surface here isn't the surface of the ground, it's the top of that sandstone, the top of the Murraysville sandstone. So I mentioned that there are some broad folds in the plateau, and these are those broad folds. Uh, these are 20, 200 foot contours. So this is 200 feet deeper, 200 feet deeper, 200 feet deeper to the top of the sandstone. This is a high, this is a low in this contour map. And here I've put an outline from that uh, 1921 map of uh, the outline of the Murraysville gas field. So this is a structural nose, it's a structural high, and the gas must have been trapped here because instead of sandstone here, there was that shaley unit that the gas couldn't flow through. Um, there has to be another reason that it's trapped in this direction, probably because it's so porous here, maybe it's less porous on those sides. But anyway, I think you get the idea that generally the gas is, in this case is trapped on a high, but there's another component to it that's the nature of the rock layer. And there's M for Murraysville, uh, and that's a map view of Murraysville Field. So now you've had a, a bit of a dive into real uh, reservoir geology in, a, in a, a gas field. Now we're going to step back again, away from those kinds of details, and move on to today and looking at uh, shale gas and the shale gas revolution. This chart on the left is uh, billions of cubic feet per day of production of natural gas. Um, you can see years at the bottom. Oops. And um, this is from conventional sources like, like Murraysville Field or other sources, uh, rich sources of, of gas that you can pump out with a vertical well. Um, uh, the dark color here, dark gray and the green are from shale gas plays. So the shale gas revolution started a little bit before this chart and conventional sources of natural gas in the US were declining. Um, if not for shale gas plays coming, uh, we probably would be importing about this much natural gas uh, from countries where it's really cheap to produce, uh, including Russia and countries in the Middle East. Uh, and companies were building liquefied natural gas import facilities to be able to make up this uh, deficit that was anticipated. But instead, the shale gas revolution came around. Um, it decreased the, the price to consumers and to price of gas energy to industry so much that drilling kind of uh, tapered off in these plays. They kind of uh, uh, hurt themselves by dropping the price because it was so abundant. Um, but it's, uh, it makes up now the biggest share of natural gas production in the US. And there's modest, a modest fraction of this instead of having a bunch of gas imported that's now being exported. Of course, uh, a lot of us and uh, probably a lot of people in Europe wish that we could export a whole lot more of it right now because we certainly have the capacity to produce it. And of these shale plays, and there are several, the most important ones are in the Appalachian Basin here where we are, especially in the plateau and also in, in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania. The Marcellus play uh, and uh, the Utica. Um, so this is the Marcellus and Utica uh, dominating this, this chart. There's a little bit of other unconventional in, in here too, but it's not much. It's really mostly Marcellus with some Utica and that's been a huge thing. These plays have been a huge thing and the southwestern Pennsylvania and adjacent states, part of the plateau is the sweet spot for this play, uh, which is so important to the US and is becoming important to other parts of the world. 
as well. I wanted to show, uh, uh, you know, what things look like at the surface uh, with this play. And the example I've chosen here is from Westmoreland County. And actually, this is not far from uh, one of the trails. Uh, uh, this is uh, Beaver Run Reservoir, which we'll see on a map of uh, one of the trails later on. So here's an aerial view of a pad, a production pad that's uh, several acres in size. Here's a close up. There are 10 wells that have been drilled here. They're in fracturing operations. You can tell by all the trucks that are here. There are 10,000 horsepower of pump trucks here. There are containers full of water. There are trucks and containers uh, full of sand too, uh, to do the fracturing operations. So that uh, multi-acre pad is the red dot on this map. Um, and uh, the map here, the scale, you can see there's a mile for scale. These blue lines are the wells, those 10 wells that were drilled from that pad. And uh, some of these were drilled maybe a mile or so long. And this is a slide from 2011. Since then, some companies in these two plays will drill wells as far as, as long as 10,000 feet. Um, so almost, well, twice as long as, as some of these. This is uh, close to a mile across here. So from one multi-acre pad, it's possible to drain an area uh, that's a few square miles in size. And you can see the other well patterns being drilled from other red dots, which were other pads um, in this case. So it's a, a pretty uh, efficient uh, way to uh, uh, produce uh, this resource. And uh, that's one of the reasons why, uh, and it produces pretty well with the proper stimulation and drilling. So those are reasons why it's a low cost supplier of uh, gas and an important part of the shale gas uh, production and the energy picture in the United States now. And in, in fact, in, uh, it's having world influence too. So I showed a map of conventional fields. I wanted to show a map of uh, unconventional wells. Most of these are Marcellus wells in Northeastern Pennsylvania, Southwestern Pennsylvania. Of course, they extend into the uh, West Virginia Panhandle along with the Utica Point Pleasant there and, and Utica Point Pleasant off into Southeastern Ohio. And uh, this, these plays extend into Northwestern Virginia outside the Panhandle too. Um, you'll notice that there's a big hole here uh, for Allegheny County. Uh, that's really uh, because of uh, political reasons. Uh, the quality of the resource is certainly there all across this area. So pretty extensive area and really the plateau is a sweet spot for the shale gas revolution in the US and in the world. Okay, I mentioned wind power when we talked about electricity generation. I'll talk about this more when we talk about the Laurel Highlands, but I just have one slide here. Um, this one shows uh, multi-year average wind speed, darker colors are higher wind speeds. And see, this has everything to do with the geology. <laughs> There's Chestnut Ridge held up by those sandstones uh, on the upper part of the fold. There's Laurel Hill. You can see uh, uh, Allegheny Mountain here is, is especially high. There's the Allegheny Front going into the fold belt. So these patterns of uh, wind favorability for wind farms uh, have everything to do with the geology that caused the landscape. And the wind form, farm that's right here inside the white box, these are individual windmills. Uh, that's Twin rid Ridges uh, Wind Farm. And here you can see it behind the cyclists who are heading to the west along the Great Allegheny Passage, going away from the wind farm. So uh, we'll talk, again, we'll talk more about that in another theme. OK, so we've been through the plateau. Uh, the last few slides here, uh, there's one each for the five trails uh, that are highlighted in this theme, first one being the panhandle. And the part of the panhandle that we'll ride is circled in red here. And we're going to start in Oakdale, uh, go through McDonald, remember the heart of the McDonald oil field. Um, and uh, the trail is, uh, uh, this is a picture of the trail in Allegheny County where it's a very well maintained, fine crushed limestone. When you get into Washington County, the whole of Washington County, it's paved asphalt. And from my experience, uh, beautifully maintained. Um, so we'll have a great time on the uh, Panhandle Trail. You get a good sampling of the Panhandle, although there are other segments of it too. And the Panhandle is here because 
it was the route of the Panhandle Division of the Pennsylvania Railroad at one time connecting Pittsburgh to St. Louis. But uh, uh, this, this, uh, uh, there's much less rail traffic now. Um, there's certainly not the need to serve coal mines that were in this area and oil fields and in this area. Um, and for other services, uh, other routes were, are adequate. The Montour Trail really could be called the Pittsburgh Coal Trail. Uh, this, the whole route here, and it's a long route, uh, served coal mines as its principal freight. There was other freight too, and there was passenger service, but this was started by a coal company and it served 27 coal mines at once. Uh, so it served a lot of coal mines. It had uh, a couple of uh, uh, branches, uh, the Westland branch here, the Bethel Park branch that served mines that were off the main part of the track, um, but really it served Pittsburgh coal and it carried up to 7 million tons of Pittsburgh coal per year. Um, it connected to all the major railroads and um, now it has connectors not related to coal. Uh, there's a mountain bike connector, uh, mountain bike connector up into South Park, and there's an airport. Oops, there's an airport connector uh, to uh, Pittsburgh International Airport as well. So it's a great trail. It's been around for a long time. The Montour Trail Council has done a wonderful thing, getting this thing together and continuing uh, to finish it where it's not all trail yet at this point. The part we've chosen to highlight here, uh, and there's a lot of uh, great trail here, but the part we've chosen to highlight is in Peters Township where it's paved asphalt. And part of this is um, just to have some variety uh, compared with other kind of more rural trails. So here's a suburban trail, paved asphalt, beautifully maintained. It's very popular. Um, and we wanted to highlight that for people and give people a chance to see it. The problem with that is um, parking can be tough, but we have some ideas for ways to deal with that. So Montour Trail could be the Pittsburgh Coal Trail. The Westmoreland Heritage Trail was chartered by George Westinghouse. They wanted to uh, get at coal deposits uh, that were mined around export and in this area, Pittsburgh coal deposits. Um, also there's Murraysville. So the Murraysville gas field was producing and being developed at this time. Um, so there was other industry going on here too. The Westmoreland Heritage Trail is in two parts. This part from Trafford to Export is the part we're going to cycle. Um, there's another part here. Um, uh, I've cycled them both, they're both great. Um, and there's an area in between where the uh, trail group is working on uh, connecting them still. Um, and uh, um, uh, all power to them. You know, it's a, it's a great trail, very well maintained. You can see a picture of, of it from this segment and it'll be great when it's uh, in one piece too. Well, I'll just point out that uh, it does go to Salzburg. And so we'll talk about Salzburg uh, on another trail. So it connects up with uh, another trail at Salzburg. And here's that other trail, the West Penn Trail goes to Salzburg. Uh, here's, here's the Westmoreland Heritage Trail coming in. So this is the part of the West Penn Trail that's our basic plan uh, for cycling. It's a flat, typical rail trail, very nice, scenic along the river. Um, it's the Connemaw River here. It turns into the Kiski River uh, at Salzburg. And it's really neat. Um, it's, it's the route of the Western Pennsylvania Railroad, which was replacing a canal. The main line of the Pennsylvania Canal went along, along here, and Salzburg is a really neat old town because it was along the canal, and the canal was active here from 1830 to when the railroad started being active in 1863. Um, the railroad continued down the river to the Allegheny, uh, it went down to Freeport, it was there by 1866, and then it connected down to uh, uh, Pittsburgh after that, and connects up to um, um, Butler. Um, so a neat, a really neat lot of history here. And in my opinion, the signage that the trail folks have put in along the trail, including within Salzburg is just exemplary. It's outstanding signage. It doesn't just talk about this building was here or this, uh, that something happened here once. It really relates the history here 
to the region, which is easy to do because the region, uh, the, the canal here was a regional feature. So it's just uh, exemplary signage and the history here is really interesting and, and we'll look forward to talking about that. And if you go on your own, you know, there are lots of resources to be able to, to uh, research this yourself, but I def definitely recommend stopping and reading the signage. I'm sure you'll learn some things and be surprised. The Sheepskin Mon River Rail Trail uh, straddles the West Virginia, Pennsylvania state line. Here you can see the state line. Um, the part will cycle uh, runs from Point Marion down to um, Morgantown here uh, along the uh, Monongahela River. And it's a very nice trail. Um, and uh, there uh, people are working on continuing to connect uh, there are a couple other pieces of the sheepskin trail that are finished, but they're trying to connect those all up so that this will be connected someday, we hope, to the Great Allegheny Passage to the north. Um, this was originally the route of the Fairmont, Morgantown, and Pittsburgh Railroad, which um, really helped uh, commercialize the southern part of the Connellsville coke fields and coal fields. There was coke and coal in this area, too, that the railroad helped connect into uh, our railroads farther north uh, that went over a, a bigger area that connected to Pittsburgh and connected to points east. Um, so this is another great trail. Um, so that's it. Those are the five trails specifically in the plateau theme. Uh, we talked about a few of the other trails that are in the plateau too that are really also in other themes. And I hope you've Enjoyed the discussion here, uh, some of the very special aspects of the plateau. I guess the next one of these I'll work on is the Connemaw Uplands. There's some really neat special things about that area too. And the, high, the Laurel Highlands one is the one I think where I'll uh, really dig into the um, landscapes and how they relate to the geology. The glacial one will have a lot of climate stuff in it and some pretty neat glacial stuff for that part of the plateau as well. So thanks, thanks for your attention and take care. Hope to see you on the trail.